many of our friends in forestry on the webinar today and also folks who I haven't met before. So I'm, I'm really glad to have this opportunity to share our work with you. This is Laura Kenefick. I am located in Orono, Maine, and I'm a research forester with the U.S. Forest Service Northern Research Station and a team leader in the Northern Forest Science and Applications Work Unit. My research focuses on silviculture, looking at long-term outcomes from our experimental forests in the Northeast and the Lake States with work in northern hardwoods, northern conifers, and mixed woods. Hi, I'm Patricia Raymond. I'm a research forester working for the Forest Research Branch of the Ministry of Forest, Wildlife and Parks. Since now 16 years, my research interest focused mostly on the ecology of silviculture of the mixed wood forest. So thank you very much everybody for attending this webinar. I'm very excited. Uh, this, so this uh, webinar will be the, is the fruit of the uh, continuous collaboration that Laura and myself had on mixed wood silviculture in northeastern North America, and reflects thoughts that we shared over the years. So today we will compare the cross-border similarities and differences in the forest and uh, civicultural practices. We will compare the characteristics of spruce mixed woods between the Northeast and Quebec. We will discuss the evolution of civicultural practices as well as the current and emerging civicultural strategies. Finally, we will talk about challenges going forward and what did we learn. The definition of mixed woods is hardwood softwood mixtures in which neither component it exceeds 75 to 80 percent of basal area. In the spruce fir forests of the northeastern United States and adjacent Canada, mixed woods occur on lowland conifer dominated sites with red maple and paper birch and on mid slopes with yellow birch. Perhaps even more so than other species mixtures, mixed woods are thought to confer benefits, including resilience to insects, disease, and climate change. Some have higher productivity, especially when adding softwoods to hardwood stands, and hardwood softwood mixtures increase market adaptability and flexibility of wood supply. Today we are focusing on mixed woods within the natural range of red spruce in the Northeast and Quebec. This ecotone between the Eastern broadleaf and boreal forest is called the Acadian forest. The region is topographically diverse due to the action of glaciers with highly variable soil drainage, site quality and abundant year round precipitation. Though historically called spruce fir, these forests are actually mixed species. In the Northeast, many spruce fir stands have some proportion of northern white cedar, eastern hemlock, and eastern white pine. In Quebec, the same species are present, but the hemlock and the pine are less abundant. In all cases, proportions of individual species and of the hardwoods in general are a function of climate, site and disturbance history. The key characteristics of the dominant conifers are shade tolerance, slow growth, and reliance on advanced regeneration. Spruce mixed woods are distinct from spruce fir stands in that they have an important component of hardwoods such as birch, maple, beech, and aspen. In some cases, these mixtures are viewed as transitional because they are the result of harvesting practices that increased sprouting or early successional hardwoods on poorly drained, low fertility softwood sites. In contrast, the spruce yellow birch type, which occurs on mid-slope positions where soil fertility is better, is viewed as a stable mixed wood composition. Competition from shrubs can be important, especially on disturbed sites. Common shrubs in spruce mixed wood stands include robust species, blueberry, American honeysuckle, 
sheep laurel, big hazel, mountain maple, vi viburnum species. Pin cherry and striped maple are also freq frequent competitors. In addition, the moist and shaded microclimate beneath the forest canopy, especially on lowlands, may support a thick layer of moss and lichens that is difficult for seedlings to penetrate without ground disturbance. Small scale disturbances are common. The return interval for stand replacing disturbances, so, such as fire, can be anywhere from 200 to 1,000 years. This disturbance regime with periodic moderate disturbances due to spruce budworm outbreaks or hurricanes results in a naturally complex species mixture and age structure. Moreover, most of the historically spruce fir or spruce mixed wood forest was never clear for agriculture. With some exceptions along the St. Lawrence River Valley and other lowlands with fertile soils. Instead, repeated partial harvesting began in the late 1700s and the late 1800s in Quebec. Overall, Three species found in both jurisdictions are basically the same, but the species arrangement can vary with local e ecological conditions. One differing factor and influential to forest composition is the longer fire return interval in the Northeast compared to Quebec because of the greater proximity to the Atlantic Ocean. With longer time between stand replacing disturbances in the Northeast, gap dynamics prevail and favor a, favor a greater abundance of shade tolerant conifers. In contrast, fires are more frequent in Quebec, resulting in greater birch abundance. I want to take a few minutes to review the evolution of silvicultural practice in the region as context for current forest condition and management needs. The historical condition of the spruce fir and spruce mixedwood forests of the Northeast and Quebec in the 1800s, which was just prior to heavy utilization, was characterized by irregularly multi-age stands of long-lived softwoods in mixture with primarily but not exclusively shade tolerant hardwoods. Individual trees ranged in age from new germinants to hundreds of years old and deadwood was abundant. In Maine, stand reconstruction suggests canopy turnover rates of less than 2% per year. In the mid 1800s to early 1900s, the spruce fir region of this area was a global leader in lumber and pulpwood production. In the Northeast, forest industry was the economic backbone of the region, but widespread cutting of commercial forest land caused degradation and public concern. In 1898, in his role as chief of the U.S. Division of Forestry, which is now the U.S. Forest Service, Gifford Pinchot wrote that forests of the Northeast were, quote, a patchwork of brush, sprout wood, and relic old and second growth timber. By the early to mid 1900s, selective cutting or high grading was common with spruce often cut down to eight inches or 20 centimeters on the stump, equivalent to six inches or 15 centimeters at breast height. This practice continued until the mid 20th century when a shift to production forestry occurred in response to the post-World War II housing boom. The war had hastened mechanization of in-woods operations, while rationing resulted in pent-up demand for wood and paper products. The use of large equipment, such as the Beloit harvester shown here, became common on commercial forest land in the spruce fir region. Advanced regeneration established by earlier selective cutting formed the new cohort or age class. Meanwhile, in Quebec, cutting history had similarities but was different. Prior to the 1900s, the only forest lands clear were for agriculture. Forest exploitation started a little later during the 1800s when sawmills were established along tributaries of the St. Lawrence River Valley. 
Large pines and spruces were targets first for lumber, but also for ship masts of the British Navy. Heavy cuttings began in the 1900s with the bloom of pulp and paper industry. Also of woods and paper birches larger than three inches were harvested. Harvested intensified even more with the mechanization of felling processes and clear cuts became common after the 1960s. We should also mention that during the late 70s into 80s, a spruce budworm outbreak resulted in widespread growth reduction in mortality. Pre-salvage and salvage operations became the norm and were not restricted to high-risk mature fir. Instead, all trees were removed across many acreages on commercial forest land. Here in Maine, where I am located, many stands during this spruce budworm era in the 1980s did not yet have advanced regeneration. And where it did occur, mortality due to logging damage was common. Heavy cutting during the spruce budworm area, er, era led to widespread forest type conversion. Many productive spruce fir stands in Maine, for example, were unintentionally converted to hardwood dominated mixed woods through harvesting. This trend can be observed in forest inventory and analysis data from the US Forest Service, which shows a 1980s reduction in spruce fir growing stock volume associated with budworm era harvesting and an increase in hardwoods that has remained stable for the last decade. Selective partial cutting or other forms of high grading can cause loss of desired species, especially those like red spruce with narrow regeneration requirements and slow growth. In Maine, for example, the forest inventory and analysis data show that red maple composition almost doubled since the mid 20th century. In addition, density of red maple growing stock trees is now greater than red spruce. Meanwhile, in Quebec, during the spruce bud warm era in Quebec, the population grew concerned about forest health, pesticide use, and sustainability of current forest practices. A new law on forests in 1986 brought a major shift in forest management. Concessions were revoked and companies became tied to the government by contracts of supply and forest management in which they had to respect the principles of sustainable management. Later, a vast consultation of the population resulted in a legally binded document called the Forest Protection Strategy with 54 recommendations. Overarching principles are to manage for diversity, to increase resistance to pests and productivity, to respect natural dynamics, to limit problems with interspecific competition, to rely on natural regeneration when possible, and to develop a preventive civicultural approach. In addition, diameter limit cutting was prohibited on public land and chemical pesticides were to be abandoned by 2001. Differences in ownership and history of practices have greatly influenced the current state of the forest in terms of quality, composition, and structure. In the Northeast, forests are mostly private and have a, had a longer and more intense pressure on their resources so that the current state of the forest is further from natural conditions. In Quebec, the constant pressure of the population has forced the province to adopt sustainable forest management practices since the 80s. Now all public forests must be managed under the principle of ecosystem management and this bill was voted in 2013 so five years ago. Now let's talk about the current and emerging civicultural strategies for spruce mi mixed woods. As general strategies, there are partial cutting, preventive civiculture, mixed wood civiculture, rehabilitation civiculture, disturbance-based management, and adaptation to climate change. 
In Maine, where most of the spruce mixed woods in the Northeast are found, current forest practices originated in the Forest Practices Act of the 1990s, which limited clear cut size and created regulatory hurdles to leaving less than 30 square feet of basal area per acre, which is seven square meters per hectare. Today, partial harvesting is widely conducted on privately owned commercial forest land with mechanized operations using cut to length processing and in woods forwarding or feller bunchers and whole tree grapple skidding. These may leave minimum allowable stocking and can result in 20 to 30% of stand area and trails. Such conditions are not favorable to shade tolerant conifer regeneration and growth. After the forest protection strategy was applied on public land in Quebec, different other strategies have been experienced during the 1990s to prevent competition problems and to live without herbicides. For example, we aim at establishing regeneration under partial cover using partial cutting treatments, including shelter wood and selection systems. We also use large stock seedlings when we, have, we need to plant. These seedlings typically have two years old and 40 centimeters in height, so over a foot tall. We use mechanical release with brush saws when needed. And this has increasing relevant relevance in the Northeast where some municipalities have prohibited use of herbicides. In Quebec, we started to develop mixed wood viticulture during the 1990s. The idea was to develop civicultural treatments to grow species mixture because softwood or hardwood oriented systems based on those developed for boreal or hardwood forest prove ineffective, such as clear cut system in spruce fir and single tree selection cutting in spruce fir hardwoods. It asked us to think outside the box. Here's an example of mixed commercial thinning developed by Marcel Prévost that promotes both hardwood and softwood crop trees uh, for the future stand production. Thinnings, selection, and shelter wood system can all be adapted to mixed wood production. Given the long history of harvesting in spruced mixed woods and the conversion of many former softwood sites through repeated partial harvesting, forest landowners often find themselves confronted with understocked mixed wood stands of undesirable species and poor quality trees. As a result, rehabilitation silviculture has arisen for restoring production potential to degraded stands. Examples include seed tree or irregular shelter wood with retention of low density residuals, site preparation to improve regeneration substrate, remove competitors, and pre-commercial treatments such as weeding and enrichment planting. Ecological forestry is perhaps the state of the art in contemporary management for both commodities and ecosystem values. This approach recognizes intrinsic value of the ecosystem and balances commodity production with biodiversity objectives. These silvicultural systems are inspired by natural disturbance dynamics. In spruced mixed woods, variants of irregular shelter wood are used with the Acadian Famelschlag developed by Bob Seymour at the University of Maine is perhaps the best known example. This is an irregular expanding gap shelter wood with reserves and includes opening sizes and gap expansion rates that are inspired by natural disturbance. Another example of this disturbance-based management is the hybrid group and single tree selection in development in Quebec for uneven age yellow birch conifer stands. It aims at emulating gap dynamics that prevail in that forest type. The idea is to create a variety of gap size and regeneration niches that permit species coexistence and promote diversity. By harvesting weak and short-lived trees first, we create a mix of single tree and small group openings and these are usually smaller than one tree height. In our experiment with harvest intensities ranging from 20 to 42 percent, we successfully recruited yellow birch and other species after eight years. 
However, the red spruce was still at very low density. This is the reason why we also experimented enrichment planting of large stock seedlings in harvest gaps to help maintain that species in the long term. In conifer dominated mixed wood stands, spruce budworm is the main driver that fashions multi age irregular stands. We are currently assessing different irregular shelterwood scenarios in balsam fir yellow birch stands in Quebec, also as an alternative to clear cut systems that prove maladapted to these forests. Because they favor hardwood species over the conifers, especially red maple. Our five year results indicate that these less intense, the less intense scenario of continuous cover irregular shelterwood with about 30% of harvest cut every 25 to 30 year could promote yellow birch, red spruce, and balsam fir regeneration. Lastly, another emerging management trend is adaptation to climate change. The idea is to use CB cultural tools to help forests to adapt to climate change with a portfolio approach either by increasing resistance to disturbance, by promoting diversity and complexity to maximize resilience, or by facilitating the adaptation to new conditions. For example, we could use pre-commercial thinning to increase the res resistance of crop trees and overall stand vigor. We could opt for selection or sh and shelterwood systems to promote diversity and structural complexity to increase the resilience for a stand. And we could use acid to migration of species and provenances that are potentially adapted to future climatic conditions and so facilitate the transition to new forest states. These treatments are not necessarily different than what is done with other approaches but behind their prescription, there is a thought that it could help the, the ecosystems to face climate changes. We see that differences in ownership type are important for current and emerging practices. In the Northeast, the large number of forest landowners and the diversity of ownership types and objectives impede forest level planning and management. Public ownership in Quebec confers more top-down control for strategies like ecological forestry and preventive or adaptive silviculture. From a regulatory perspective, herbicides remain a viable silvicultural tool throughout much of the Northeast commercial forest land, but not in Quebec. That means in theory, it is easier to manage undesirable species in degraded mixed wood stands in the Northeast than Quebec. Maine Senator Angus King recently described the forest economy in this state as a natural disaster and a slow moving hurricane. Pulpwood and biomass markets have collapsed in many parts of the state. Infrastructure is aging and employment in forestry and logging is on the decline. Though other parts of the region are in better shape, it is generally acknowledged that investments in infrastructure, technology, and products are needed to make the region's forest industry more competitive in a global market. Until that is achieved, lack of markets is an impediment to some silvicultural strategies, particularly those that generate low-grade wood. Ralph Nyland, who is the father of rehabilitation silviculture, describes that practice as restoring functionality. From a commodity production perspective, functionality is the ability to produce wood at a rate and value acceptable to the landowner. Treatments and stands without acceptable production potential often break even at best or require an investment. In addition, rehabilitation of conifer dominated stands doesn't generally lead to the great improvements as seen in hardwoods, so it's difficult to earn back an investment from improved tree growth and quality alone. With per acre costs from $200 to more than $600 per acre in some pre-commercial rehabilitation experiments, this is a real concern for widespread application. Some species within the spruce mixed woods, like red spruce, 
have been declining in abundance in the Northeast. Red spruce seeds less frequently, has narrower regeneration substrate requirements, and grows more slowly than many of its competitors. Past exploitation of this species, selective removal of seed trees, increases in competitive its species and loss of suitable regeneration microsites have contributed to decrease its abundance over time. Specific modalities may be required to maintain species with biodiversity issues in the ecosystem, such as maintaining, for example, maintaining seed trees as, uh, as legacy trees, protecting advanced regeneration, and using enrichment planting in forest openings. And these recommendations could also apply to other companion species with regeneration concerns like eastern white pine and northern white cedar. Expansion of red maple is also a concern for the future of the spruce mixed wood forest. Despite its shade tolerance, red maple can behave like a pioneer species and has been increasing in mixed woods due to harvesting. This species has been called a climate change winner, meaning that it is expected to respond positively to anticipated changes in temperature and moisture regimes. But this issue is complicated and different patterns have emerged. In the Northeast, the prevalence of partial harvesting with repeated cutting of red maple stems facilitates sprouting. Herbicide control is one possibility, but this option has been prohibited by some local governments. In addition, Markets are now better for hardwood than softwood pulp in some areas, meaning that there is little financial incentive to manage against red maple in some parts of our region. Deer and moose present in the temperate mixed wood forests of the Northeast and Quebec can cause regeneration failures or seriously damage future crop trees. It is well known that herbivory, especially from white-tailed deer in the US, is a controlling factor on tree species composition and recruitment success in areas with high deer populations. Some of the hardwood associates in the spruce mixed wood, such as yellow birch, are preferred by deer. This is not presently a severe problem everywhere, but anticipated global warming. With that, there could be more deer in the system looking for food. So this could become more of an issue in the future with impacts farther north than currently seen. Up to now, the current spruce budworm epidemic is mostly causing damages in the boreal forest, but infestation is now overlapping the mixed wood forest in Quebec and New Brunswick. We don't know how the forest will be affected exactly in its dynamics. Damage is usually less important in mixed woods than in conifer stands, and less in the Northeast than in Quebec and New Brunswick. And because of the proportion of hot woods has increased since the last epidemic, we can hope that damage will be less. However, there's a lot of uncertainty related to that question. And last but not the least, Climate changes associated with temperature warming, increased frequency of extreme events, and potential new pests may challenge us in the future. All this can affect the mixed wood forest. Could we lose species? Boreal species at the certain margin of their range, like the red and white spruces, are among the species that might be in trouble. This could also affect the mixed character of the mixed wood forest, as hardwood species could also migrate up north. This challenge of adaptation implies that we start developing the reflex to think about how each of our three cultural actions can influence the capacity of forests to face uncertainty in climate change. Civiculture could be the best tool to contribute to forest adaptation. Aristotle said, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. This is true of spruce mixwoods. Understanding spruce fir or northern hardwoods isn't the same as understanding mixedwoods. There is undoubtedly more complexity in mixedwood stands. In addition, not all mixedwoods are equal. 
Those which are the result of high grading of lowland spruce fir, for example, pose different challenges and warrant different treatments than spruce yellow birch mixtures. When Patricia and I were preparing our presentation for you today, we found that the spruced mixed wood forests of the Northeast and Quebec have a lot in common. Yet different land use histories and public versus private ownership influence the state of the forest and the practice of silviculture. Challenges going forward will be similar in the two regions, and it makes sense that we unify our efforts. So with that, we urge you to go forth in managed mixed woods, not for this, but for this. Well, I think that's all for today. Thank you very much for listening and we will be very happy to answer your questions. Okay, thank you very much, Laura and Patricia. So we do have some questions and if there are, um, if you all have questions, this is the time to be typing them in just before we lose folks. I wanna remind you all that the continuing education credits have been taken care of by your registration. When you registered for the webinars, that was um, data was collected. So we have some questions already. Um, do uh, Laura and Patricia, how are we going to handle <laughs> questions? I, Laura, um, Laura, you're going to read them. Is that right? Laura? I'm going to. Patricia has been doing a wonderful job in um, a language that's not her first, and right. so I will. Um, read the questions and then Patricia and I will respond as appropriate. So the first one we have is from Tom Ward who asks, what's the best approach for addressing high graded stands presently occupied by low quality hardwoods? For example, red maple, gray birch, and shrubs. So both Patricia and I have some work with rehabilitation. I will share our experience here. Um, at the Penobscot Experimental Forest in Maine, we are doing experimental pre-commercial rehabilitation in stands that were 80% um, softwoods in 1950 and through repeated high grading for the purposes of research are now hardwood dominated mixed wood stands. And the most abundant species we have there are red maple, 25% of stand basal area, predominantly in stump sprouts. We have balsam fir, um, non-commercial species including gray birch and pin cherry. And what we did is we went into these stands when they were in the, the large sapling to small pole size, which was pushing it towards a pre-commercial treatment. And we did a couple of different approaches. And one of them was what we call a crop tree release. So we went through at intervals and found the best hardwood and softwood trees that were present. The softwoods were stratified to a lower canopy layer beneath the hardwood, so we released them independently in the two layers. We found the best paper birch, single stem red maple, or good quality red maple stump sprouts that are low on the stump and free of decay. We released those on three sides using a crown touching approach. We did the same for any spruce, um, hemlock, white pine, or northern white cedar we had in the stand. And our intention there was to improve the growth of the most promising hardwoods for later removal in a commercial thinning to maintain the softwoods in the stand for ultimately an eye to regenerating the stand down the line with an irregular shelter wood. We, in addition to the crop tree release, we did some what we call timber stand improvement, which was removal of the non-commercial species and the unacceptable growing stock, even where they were not competing with the crop trees. That doesn't seem to have been worth the extra effort. That was very expensive. We used both mechanical release and herbicides to do this treatment, and the cost cannot be recouped for that more intensive treatment through future improvements in the growth and quality of the stand. So right now it looks like more of a crop tree approach integrated stands. We did do some fill planting and under planting of red spruce because the regeneration stocking had been reduced to zero for that species. Um, that largely was not successful because um, snowshoe hare ate all the spruce seedlings. They got shorter every year when we went out and checked them over five years and the majority are now 
dead. So in that sort of treatment, careful protection of your, your investment in planting is important. Patricia, do you want to share anything from the rehabilitation ex experiments you, you all have in Quebec? Yes, we have experiments uh, going on, but uh, the, the, the results uh, are coming up. So I, I, I think you did a very good uh, answer. <laughs> good okay. reply. Maybe we can um, move to the next question. I, the next question I see also from Tom was about the enrichment planting, the best adapted native conifer, the influence of site spruce versus white pine versus red pine. In our study, we chose spruce because we were looking to do a bit of restoration as part of our treatment. Um, I think that certainly managing other planting other conifer species or perhaps planting them in mixture would make a lot of sense. Um, any thoughts on enrichment planting, Patricia? I think the question was also regarding the, the provenance. Mm -hmm. Ask if the best uh, adapted native conifer. Yes, I think so. But I think we, can, we could, if we want to think about the future, it could be a good idea to uh, plant uh, a little more certain uh, provenances to uh, to, to help the forest adapt to future climate change. But you know, these uh, assisted migration experiments have started to show results, but of course uh, we, we can make trials, but it's not something that we must necessarily adopt to a large scale for now. But I think we can already think about it. Uh, regarding white pine, uh, there, there are issues with uh, white pine blister rust. So on wet sites, it's not a good idea. Any site where you can have uh, ribus species that is the which is the alternate host um, so on dry sites drier sites it would make sense so the next question we have is about um, species diversity the comment from Carl Dupont is it sounds like species diversity is the key to long-term sustainability any additional thoughts I would say clearly our work suggests that having a diversity not just of species but of species with different functional traits as would be seen in hardwoods and softwoods together that serve different roles in the ecosystem and have different growth characteristics, different vulnerabilities to forcing agents such as insects, um, gives you more options in the future. It gives you more flexibility, both in the terms of management and in terms of um, resistance and resilience. So certainly I think species diversity is important, but I think which species you have is also important. I would venture that on some of our degraded um, lowland softwood sites, which have been converted to mixed woods and have a lot of those intolerant hardwoods, they might have greater tree species diversity than they did when they were softwood dominated. But those hardwood species are what we would call like in old school terminology off site, right? They're, that's not a hardwood site. And so when you think of the greater landscape, um, maybe we didn't add anything to those sites, even though diversity increased. Patricia, do you have additional thoughts? No, that's good. Okay, so next question. This one's for Patricia. Could uh, This is from Tom McKay. Could you provide more detail on the continuous cover irregular shelterwood system? Patricia, you are the expert on that, so take it away. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the continuous cover irregular shelterwood system is somehow between a regular shelterwood system and a selection system. Uh, the main difference with the other shelterwood uh, systems is that there is no final cut. So you come back, uh, you, you make multiple entries in your stand and maintain an irregular uh, structure. And you don't necessarily come back at regular um, paces like you do in selection system. Regarding the cut itself, uh, the, the harvest uh, itself, um, uh, we did mark, we, we, we marked trees in the stands uh, that are uh, high quality. Um, and uh, the idea is to maintain the most vigorous uh, trees. Uh, what I also wanted to say is the 
the harvest is based on the on the tree species and a tree vigor. So we will remove the trees that are less vigorous first. And um, so because we do that, uh, we create some heterogeneity in, in the stands. So we might we may have harvest by trees or by small groups of trees. And this is an advantage because you can, in theory, satisfy the requirement, ecological requirements of a greater number of species. So that's how we how we do that. Maybe you want numbers. Um, so here we work with the uh, hypothesis that with a harvest of 30%, we could come back in uh, 30 years, each, about each 30 years. Well, like I said, it doesn't need to be at a regular uh, time. timing. Is that correct, Laura? <laughs> yeah, no, that's good. And I would also point out to those of you who are interested, Patricia has published a really great article that reviews the different variants of irregular shelterwood, and it has diagrams in it to explain the different steps. And that was in the Journal of Forestry. So if you look up um, Patricia Raymond, Journal of Forestry, Irregular Shelterwood, you should find that article. Patricia, do you recall the year that that was published? 2009. 2009. There you go. Yes. So that's a that's a great resource um, for anyone interested in it. Um, so we have a question from Richard Fenton. Has anyone tried establishing plantations of white spruce, red spruce, and balsam fir? I can speak um, from what I've seen here in Maine. Um, one of our large commercial forest land owners does do some planting and I think a more common species mixture would be the red spruce, black spruce, and eastern white pine. When we think about vulnerability to the spruce budworm, which for those of you who aren't super familiar with that, it's a native insect pest that has, it like hangs out all the time up in Quebec and then every 40 years or so it kind of blows up and has a big epidemic and um, they're having one in Quebec right now, which I see there's a follow-up question on that. When we think of vulnerability to the spruce budworm, the, the, the species it, it gets on the most is the balsam fir, followed by the white spruce, the red spruce, and the black spruce. And that has to do with the phenology of those species and the timing of bud bud flushing relative to the cycles of the insect. So certainly um, species mixtures are used, but I think the, the black spruce is more common than the red because of the budworm concern. Do you want to comment on that, Patricia? Um, yeah, I think the, the mixed plantations of conifer species are, are not yet very common, but could be, uh, yes, are, are growing in interest. I know that the tree nurseries uh, start to produce, uh, have mixed productions. So obviously, uh, in the practice, there are mixed plantations, but it's just starting, I think, in Quebec. So yeah, more common in New Brunswick. Are there currently any budworm aerial spraying programs in Quebec or New Brunswick? If so, is it limited to Bacillus thuringiensis? And if none, are they planned as part of the management planning? This is from Stephen Holt, and absolutely there are spray programs going on. I'll let Patricia start with the answer to this since she is actually in Canada. Uh, yes. Um... Yes, there are spraying programs. Uh, in Quebec, they, they use uh, BT. And uh, so the idea, well, it, I'm not a, a bloodworm specialist, but I, I read, uh, I know that uh, my ministry is uh, working hard on that. And um, I, I just read earlier that they want to uh, keep alive at least 50% of the current year foliage. So the idea is to, uh, well, they want to limit the cost and target the right, the good, right sprays to do and to limit uh, tree mortality. And yes, we have a, a good program of, uh, to, to uh, watch the, 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 the epidemic and to uh, also uh, to spray. Uh, New Brunswick has a different approach. I think the, the, the um, the epidemic is, is not as uh, intense as in Quebec right now. Uh, we met David McLean uh, 
last week, which is uh, the specialist <laughs> on that. And he has uh, research projects and they are doing um, preventive uh, spraying. But I could not tell you much more about it. But maybe contact him if you need more information. So my familiarity with the program in New Brunswick is, is a very large scale targeted early intervention program and they're using Mimic, which is um, a pesticide and doing repeated applications to try to minimize um, loss of the resource. And it's a, um, a really big, um, well-funded effort um, taken on to try to prevent losses in the, in the forest products industry. Um, we have a question from Jean-Martin Lucier at the Canadian Forest Service. Hi, Jean-Martin. What is the current state of knowledge about expected winners and losers following climate change in the Acadian forest? There is um, some really great work has been done by the Northern Research Station of the U.S. Forest Service. There is a website if you go on within the Northern Research Station Climate Hub. Um, where you can look at the projected outcomes for different species. And there was recently a publication, which I don't have on my desk at this moment. The lead author would have been Maria Janowiak, J-A-N-I-O-W-A-K, um, looking at the species of the Northeast and what the projected winner or loser status is. And that terminology comes from work done by my colleague Lewis Iverson and um, you know some of the species that are at the southern limit of their range here in particular are anticipated to be over the long term climate losers although they may benefit in the short term from increased warming or greater precipitation um, red maple is sort of universally everywhere it grows a climate winner so that's discouraging to those of us who feel like we have enough red maple already. Ernest Metz says to us, red spruce was native to the mountains of Western Maryland. Now it is found primarily in mountain bogs and swampy areas. It has been planted in storm damaged areas and has proven resistant to deer damage. Some of your slides show deer damage. In your areas of rehabilitation, has the underplanting of red spruce survived? Largely no, but it's because of the hair. And that's something that's been observed by others working in the Acadian forest. Um, I've heard about it in Vermont and elsewhere in Maine, that um, those planted red spruce are very vulnerable to browsing by hair. And I also can tell you, um, my colleague, Alessio Mortaletti at the University of Maine is doing a fascinating study on red spruce seed predation where he's put out little dishes of red spruce seed and balsam fir seed in cages in all different forest conditions and they put cameras on them and they see what goes in these little cages and eats the seeds and rodents, um, red squirrels are um, going in and eating all the red spruce seed and they don't like the fur. In fact, he has one video, it's my favorite. It shows um, a squirrel starts to eat the fur seed and he literally spits it out again. So red spruce is favored um, from a seed predation perspective and that is another challenge to recruit, regenerating and recruiting that important species in our forest type. Patricia, did you wanna add anything about that? No, nope, that's good. Now where we do see really concerning impacts of deer in the Acadian forest um, with, re re with regard to the conifers is the northern white cedar. Even at a relatively low deer density, we're seeing recruitment failures of white cedar, but that's a whole nother topic. Okay, from Brendan Kelly at Morrisville, we have the question for you, Patricia, please define an irregular shelter wood. Okay, that's, <laughs> that's a big question, <laughs> but quickly, it's a civic cultural system um, that aims at uh, harvesting gradually the stands, and because the regeneration period, so the time between the first regeneration cut and the final cut is longer than 20% of uh, the rotation. <laughs> I need to translate simultaneously in my brain. <laughs> so you you end up with at least one age class. So 
this system generates tens with, with uh, at least two age classes, two to four age classes. It's somehow between um, um, regular uniform or, or uniform uh, shelter with system and a selection system. Um, I, I didn't expect this question. I wish I would have prepared something for uh, do you want to add something, Laura? No, I think that's fair. And I guess what I would say, you know, at, at Irregular Shelterwood, we used to talk about two age stands. Um, so a two age stand could be an Irregular Shelterwood, but we think of Irregular Shelterwood as much broader. It's sort of a way of applying even age regeneration and stand tending strategies to create a stand that has multiple age classes. So in a uniform Shelterwood, you might go in, you might do your preparatory and establishment cuts and then remove the entire overstory. You have one age class. In an irregular shelter wood, you would perhaps leave some of the trees from the previous stand. And in the ir ir irregular expanding gap shelter wood that Bob Seymour has proposed, you go in and you remove trees from a certain amount of the stand on sort of like a cutting cycle but you never achieve a truly uneven aged condition. It's, um, it's a way to do even aged management that retains structural diversity of at least two and possibly more age classes to have a more complex stand. I guess that's the best way I would explain it off the fly. John Kernat asks us, can you put forward your ideas on how the silvicultural different silvicultural histories between the Northeast and Quebec are evident in how mixed forests developed. Well, you know, I can just speak to this from my own observations of what I've seen in the Northeast and in Quebec specifically, and that is that we had a longer period of exploitation. We were settled earlier, we started earlier with the extraction of desirable species, and so I think when we think about a second growth or a third growth forest, a lot of this wasn't cleared for agriculture, but it was heavily cut repeated, repeatedly, and I think it was heavily cut repeatedly for longer here in the States. And because of that, I think as Patricia mentioned earlier, our stands are in many cases farther away from what we would think of as you know a natural and i'm doing air quotes which no one can see a natural or pre-settlement condition when i look at some of the stands down here that landowners are confronted with they would be what i would consider highly degraded relative to the original composition and structure and where we've looked at similar work in Quebec, their start, their baseline, where they're starting from, seems to be somewhat better than what where we're starting from as far as the composition and retention of things like yellow birch or spruce. That might be an overgeneralization, but that's what my observation has been. Patricia, do you want to comment on that? I think that overall you have more even age stands, even age mixed wood stands, mm -hmm. because we we do have also uh, we also had diameter limit cutting in the past, and these could lead to irregular stand structures. But we also have stands that of better quality that are uneven age. So this uh, provides well, it's a difference, but it provides more flexibility and. Uh, how we want to manage the forest. Yep, that's fair. We have a question from John Scanlon. What is the estimated range of cost per hectare of enrichment plantings versus the stumpage value at the time of a subsequent harvest? Patricia, do you have any thoughts about this? Oh, cost? I, don't, I don't have numbers now. <laughs> I don't either. I'm sorry. But um, we can figure that out and get back to you. Yeah, that's a good question. It is a good question. Um, so, sorry, John, now we've disappointed you. Carl Dupont asks us, any thoughts about trying to mimic the natural world for greater resilience and sustainability as well as natural disturbance regimes? Hmm. Trying to mimic the natural world. I'm not sure I get the question. Patricia? I'm not sure either. I think my need 
mean the natural dynamics? Um, I think we, we, we did provide examples in the, in the seminar. Yeah, and certainly both resilience and sustainability would be an objective of that work. Yes, the idea is to, 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 ins to be inspired by the natural complexity of uh, for natural forest lands and yep. to maintain biodiversity as insurance policy for the future. Uh, do you um, say that insurance policy? I don't think so. <laughs> insurance, uh, something. <laughs> So um, we have some folks here have put up some links to some relevant articles. Thank you for that. Here's a question again from Brendan at Morrisville. Are deer exclosures commonly used or needed in any of the regions discussed? They're not commonly used. Um, where we, so when I think about deer exclosures, in my, what I've seen in Pennsylvania, for example, is that they're basically have had in the past like wholesale regeneration failures or recruitment failures because of the really high intensity of deer browsing. What we see up here in the spruce mixed woods is more of an effect on individual species. And for example, I mentioned northern white cedar. That actually is a really big concern. There's across the southern part of the Acadian forest, we're not recruiting northern white cedar on many sites because of pressure from deer browsing. But northern white cedar um, is not uh, the dominant component of that forest ecosystem. And so though we are concerned about it, it hasn't motivated anyone to want to invest in fencing. Um, we talk more about doing things like growing cedar in mixture with other species that are not palatable to, to deer to um, try to confer what's called associational resistance or using logging slash or tops to try to um, reduce access managing cedar at times when deer abundances are low. Generally, it's regarded that the cost of um, exclosures would isn't merited relative to the value of the trees that we're growing up here. It's, it's different down um, in the Appalachian, or Allegheny, excuse me, Allegheny hardwoods than um, it is here where we're dealing primarily with relatively low value conifer species. Patricia, want to add anything about deer exclosures? Um, well, we, we don't use them much uh, in Quebec because uh, of course it's very expensive but we use these uh, in uh, some of our experiments to show uh, what, what are the impacts of uh, deer well the deer impacts on uh, natural regeneration and vegetation dynamics thank you uh, Amanda hi Amanda has put up um, links to the New England and Northern New York forest ecosystem vulnerability assessment that's that recent publication by Janowiak et al that talks about how different forest types within that region and individual species are expected to react to climate change so that's a really nice resource and that's a new publication for those who aren't aware of it we have a question from Thomas McKay I would guess that a regular shelter wood system has high within stand variability. Yes, it actually does. How do you measure and evaluate stands with that much variation in composition? So that is a good question. Patricia, how, how would you all suggest <laughs> managing that? Um, yes, well, I, we, we don't measure these stands in a different way than we do with the selection systems or with the, any partial cutting. Um, we found it easier to to manage it using basal areas because uh, I think it was easier to to control uh, the density uh, this way because we are not using spacing spacing distances between trees. So I know some other people use other methods, but so far that's what I, I've done and it's working quite well. I think this is a case where you'd want to think about stratifying your sampling regime by what we would call like a gap versus matrix condition. So many of the irregular shelter woods utilize gap openings or expanding gaps. And so sampling what is your new cohort, which would be in the gap versus the between gap area 
um, okay, yeah. is, I think would be helpful in this regard. And as far as harvesting, um, there's a few different approaches that have been suggested for this. So the approach that Bob Seymour uses in his work is he goes out and he finds areas where there's regeneration established to be released or um, you know, large trees, for example, of white pine that he wants to create an opening around to allow new regeneration. He lays those out in GIS and gives that information to the logger. So it's like an area control sort of thing. You know, you're, you're harvesting in those areas. There's also been some work by um, Jean-Martin Lucier and others at the Canadian Forest Service, as well as Gaetan Pelletier from the Northern Hardwood Research Institute, looking at what's called the multiple treatment approach. So saying that you would identify in your stand different conditions. So one would be where you would want to regenerate. Another would be where you want to do some thinning. And you have different um, substand prescriptions that you can then give to the operator and he would apply, he or she would apply those as necessary. Um, okay, let's see. What would be examples of natural disturbances? Ice storms, oh, this is from Tom Ward. Ice storms, hurricane, insect outbreaks, and the typical size of openings created. Um, certainly, yeah, okay. The, the type of disturbance that you're trying to emulate would influence the silvicultural system that you would use. And, um, work by some of my colleagues here in New England have suggested a canopy turnover rate of about 2% per year. Now that's really small openings, but the, when we get into the spruce mixed wood forest and particularly where there's a good proportion of balsam fir, the spruce budworm, which has a 40 year cycle with every other cycle being more severe creates um, a more intensive canopy opening. And this was a model that was put forward by um, Gordon Baskerville, who's a scientist in New Brunswick many years ago. And he published a really cool paper in the Forestry Chronicle that was called Spruce Budworm Super Silviculturist. And he proposed that the natural dynamic of the spruce budworm would reduce the proportion of balsam fir, its preferred host, in a stand and release the spruce, which grows much longer than the balsam fir does. So when you're dealing in stands like those that Patricia is managing in here in the northern part of the Acadian forest in the States, we could consider those more frequent disturbances in the development of our silvicultural system. And that would, in theory, push us away from the single tree and group selection to the more area control, irregular shelter wood approach. So a greater canopy opening. Patricia comments on that? I think you're doing a great job, Laura. Oh my gosh, I feel I need to stop answering all the questions. Okay, so Amanda. Are there many, still many left? Amanda, we're almost at the end. Amanda puts <laughs> up a comment for those who are interested. There is an adaptive silviculture for climate change collaborative effort that's led by uh, Linda Nagel in Colorado and Tony D'Amato at the University of Vermont, as well as some others in the Forest Service and at universities. So these study sites look at climate adaptation aspects um, in New Hampshire and Minnesota, and Amanda has put up the website for that. So thank you. And aha, Jean Martin offers to ask you a question in French. <laughs> Yeah, why not? <laughs> and then here we have a comment from Stephen Holt, just noting as someone very involved in the main budworm outbreak in the 70s and 80s, this was a great update. Wonderful. Well, thank you all for your, wow, these were really awesome questions. This these were awesome. these were great questions. This was a very high level conversation that, that I, was a lot of, was a lot of, I mean, I just sat here and enjoyed it. So that was uh, easy for me. I appreciate all that you all have put into it. So um, join me in thanking. Uh, Laura and Patricia, and if uh, they'll be back again at seven o'clock tonight. And uh, for those of you that want to see this again, um, and my thanks to all of you who are participating, and my thanks to Laura and Patricia. This was a really great job. I appreciate that. So thank you all. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Merci. <laughs>